past members. Joseph Abate, Joseph F. Abate, July 8, 1902-1994, also known as Joe, was a capo in the family's New Jersey faction. In the 1920s, Abate served as an enforcer for Al Capone in Chicago before settling in New Jersey. In June 1976, Abate attended Anthony Accettuoro induction ceremony into the Lucchese family. In 1979, Abate went into semi-retirement and Accettuoro succeeded him as boss of the New Jersey faction. He moved to Margate, New Jersey and served as a liaison between families in New Jersey until 1989 when he retired from Mafia Affairs. In 1992, his daughter Catherine Abate was appointed New York City's new correction commissioner. She was confronted about her father's past and denied that he was ever involved in organized crime. In 1994, Joseph Abate died of natural causes. In 1998, his daughter Catherine admitted that she could no longer dismiss allegations that her father belonged to the Lucchese crime family. Sadamo Accardi Sadamo, Big Sam Accardi, October 23, 1902 in Vita, Sicily, December 3, 1977. He served as capo in the family's New Jersey faction up until his deportation, and was one of the largest heroin traffickers during the 1950s. Accardi emigrated to the U.S. shortly before World War I and associated with mobsters Joseph Sica, Willie Moretti, Joe Adonis and Abner Zwillman. During World War II, Accardi sold counterfeit food ration cards. On January 22, 1945, he became a naturalized U.S. citizen. His naturalization was revoked on July 10, 1953 because he had not disclosed two previous arrests during his naturalization hearing. In 1955, Accardi was arrested on a federal narcotics charge in Newark. New Jersey. After posting a $92,000 bond, Ocardi skipped bail and fled to Turin, Italy, where he continued smuggling heroin into the U.S. and Canada. Ocardi later moved to Toronto, Canada, to oversee this operation. In 1960, U.S. authorities finally located Ocardi in Turin, Italy and on November 28, 1963, after a long legal fight, Accardi was extradited back to New York. On July 21, 1964, Accardi was convicted on narcotics conspiracy and skipping bail. On August 24, he was sentenced to 15 years of imprisonment and to $16,000 fine. He died on December 3, 1977. Robert Caravaggio Robert, Bucky the Boss Caravaggio, died July 28, 2017, was a soldier and former capo of the New Jersey faction. From 1986 to 1988, Caravaggio was one of the 20 defendants in the 21-month-long trial of Lucchese crime family's New Jersey faction. In August 1997, Caravaggio, along with other members of the Lucchese family's New Jersey faction, was indicted and charged with racketeering, loan sharking and gambling. In 2004, the New Jersey Commission of Investigation stated that Caravaggio was the head of the Lucchese crime family's North Jersey faction. Caravaggio was overseeing operations in Northern Jersey, especially in Morris County. Caravaggio died on July 28, 2017 from pancreatic cancer. Alfonso Cataldo Alfonso T. Tick Cataldo, died August 21, 2013, was a soldier in the New Jersey faction. Cataldo grew up in Newark, New Jersey with his cousins Michael and Martin Trixetta. From 1986 to 1988, Cataldo was one of the 20 defendants in the 21-month-long trial of Lucchese crime family's New Jersey faction. During the trial Cataldo was listed as a member supervising numbers and loan sharking operations in New Jersey. In 2002, Cataldo was indicted on illegal gambling and for the October 7, 1981 murder of William Kennedy. In 2004, the New Jersey Commission of Investigation stated that Cataldo was running illegal gambling operations in New Jersey. In December 2007, Cataldo was indicted along with Capos Joseph Napoli, Matthew Madonna and Ralph V. Perna and others on gambling, 
money laundering and racketeering charges. On August 21, 2013, Gitaldo died of natural causes. Ettor Coco Ettor Eddie Coco, July 12, 1908 Palermo, Sicily, December 1991 is a former acting boss in the Lucchese family. In the 1940s, Coco worked with James Plumeri, Frank Palermo, Harry Siegel and Felix Bocciccio for soldier Frankie Carbo in a group known as The Combination, an arm of murder. Incorporated, which acted as boxing promoters. The group was accused of fixing matches. During this period, Coco met Rocky Graziano, then an amateur boxer fighting in the Lower East Side. He helped Graziano start a professional boxing career and throughout the following years was viewed as a de facto boxing manager. In the late 1940s, Coco was suspected of placing wagers and taking bets on fights while Graziano was accused of taking bribes. These accusations continued until Graziano retired in 1952. In 1953, Coco was arrested in Florida for murdering the Miami car wash operator in a dispute over a bill. On November 12, 1953, Coco was sentenced to life in prison. During the 1963 McClellan hearings, Government witness Joseph Valagi identified Coco as a capo in Gaetano, Tommy Lucchese's crime family. In 1965, Coco was released from prison after serving 10 years on his life sentence. He stayed in Florida and was under government surveillance. In July 1967, family boss Thomas Lucchese died and Coco became a candidate to become the new boss. He served as acting boss in 1967. In late 1967, Anthony, Tony Dux Corrala went to Florida and meet with Coco. He later stepped down as acting boss and Carmine Tremonti became the new boss. Coco continued to operate as a capo under Tremonti, with criminal activities in New York and Florida that kept him under strict government watch. In 1972, Coco, his brother-in-law James Michael Falco, and Louis, Louis Nash, Nakaladsky were indicted in Miami on extortion and loan sharking charges. During the trial, witness Joel Whitehouse testified that he borrowed money in the late 1960s from Falco. He made payments to Falco, Coco and Nash, and described Coco as the leader of a loan sharking ring. Coco was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison on loan sharking and extortion. By the late 1980s, Coco was considered a semi-retired mobster living in Florida. In 1986, he served as consigliere for the Lucchese family while boss Anthony Corallo, Salvatore Santoro and Christopher Farnari were on trial in the commission case. Coco later resigned and continued to operate in New York and Florida. In 1986, Coco created a bingo operation to launder money from criminal rackets. The mobsters used Bingo World, a company operating bingo halls in several states, to launder the money. Coco and Chicago outfit members Dominic Cortina and Donald Angelini became silent partners in the company. The new owner, Stephen Poskind, served as the front owner of the company. While claiming he controlled 84%, he actually only had 42%. Isaac Silber soon joined in the bingo operation. In 1991, Coco and his bingo partners were arrested. In December 1991, Coco died while awaiting trial on money laundering. Ralph Cuomo Ralph Raffi Cuomo died 2008, also known as Raffi Eel, was a soldier who owned Ray's Pizza on Prince Street between Elizabeth and Mott Streets in Little Italy. In 1959, Cuomo opened the first, Ray's Pizza, he later opened another in the Upper East Side. In 1969, he was convicted of drug trafficking after being found with 50 pounds of heroin. In 1998, Cuomo was sentenced to four years in prison for making heroin sales in the pizzeria. He was released from prison on May 24, 2002. Cuomo died in 2008 and his Ray's Pizza on Prince Street closed over a rent dispute in October 2011. Domenico Cute Domenico Danny Cute, born November 22, 1936 East New York, Brooklyn.
August 14, 2018, was the capo of the Vario crew operating from Brooklyn. His son Salvatore Cutea is a member of the crew. His daughter Danielle married John Podenza, who later became a member of the Lucchese family. Cutea worked as a loan shark and as a chauffeur for Capo Paul Vario. While working for Capo Paul Vario, Cute also controlled some illegal gambling operations and had control of the Carpenters Union local in Brooklyn. He later took over as Capo of Vario's crew in Brooklyn. During the early 1990s he was a member of a ruling panel along with Stephen Curry, Joseph to feed running the crime family. In 1995, Cute was indicted for extortion, loan sharking, and racketeering. In 1996, he pled guilty to extortion and extensions of credit and was sentenced to 30 months in prison. In 2002, Cutea was indicted on loan sharking charges. He pled guilty and was sentenced to two years and three years of supervised probation upon his release. In August 2005, he was released from prison. His parole terms banned him from communicating with family members until August 2008. However, in January 2007 it was reported that Cutea was the primary liaison between jail boss Vittorio, Vic, Amuso and the three-man panel of capos who were running the family. On February 28, 2008, Cutea, his son Salvatore, his son-in-law John Potenza, and former acting capo Michael Corsione were indicted on federal racketeering charges that included loan sharking, extortionate collection of credit, extortion, marijuana distribution conspiracy, illegal gambling, bank fraud, and mail fraud for activities dating back to the 1980s. On October 25, 2009, Cutea was sentenced to 39 months in federal prison for bank fraud. At the sentencing, Cutea's attorney asked the court for home confinement, saying that Cutea suffered from depression and advanced multiple sclerosis. The request was denied. In October 2012, Cutea was sentenced to one year in prison for loan sharking. Cutea was released from prison on October 4, 2013. He died on August 14, 2018. Paul Correal Paul, Polly Ham Correal, April 25, 1911, died, was a capo in the family. Correal controlled gambling and narcotics in East Harlem. In December 1930, Correal and Carmine Tremonti had charges of robbery dropped and they were released from jail. Correal ran a Lucchese family gambling club between 2nd Avenue and East 112th Street in East Harlem. In 1952, Joseph Valigi and others murdered Eugenio Giannini near Correal's club. Anthony Delasco Anthony Ham Delasco, sometimes spelled Delasco, was a former boxer and capo in New Jersey. In the 1950s, he took over the Jersey crew after Sedimo Cardi was deported. Delasco ran his crew from East Orange, New Jersey, where he controlled jukebox machines cigarette vending machines, illegal gambling and loan sharking operation in Newark, New Jersey. In the late 1950s, Delasco took Anthony Axetchuro as his protege. Delasco died in the late 1960s, his rackets were taken over by Axetchuro. Anthony D. Lopi Anthony D. Lopi, February 9, 1936, February 4, 1990, also known as Blue Eyes Over the Bridges or Fat Anthony, was a soldier. His uncle, Salvatore Santoro, was a former underboss in the Lucchese family. D. Lopi controlled the Lucchese family's Teamsters Union in New York City's garment district and the bookmaking business, and owned part of a vending machine company in Brooklyn. He also worked with Thomas Gambino the son of Carlo Gambino and son-in-law of Thomas Lucchese, in extorting businesses in the garment district. After being released from prison, De Lopi was summoned to a meeting with Anthony Castle, and fled. Castle ordered Burton Kaplan to use two NYPD detectives on his payroll, Louis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa, to track down De Lopi. The two detectives found him in Rosetta, California. Vic Amuso and Anthony Castle then ordered Joseph, Little Joe, D. Arco to kill D. Lopi. 
On February 4, 1990, the Arco shot Dilapi to death in his Hollywood, California, apartment building's underground garage. Dilapi was shot five times in the face and four times in the body. On April 6, 2006, Apolito and Caracapel were convicted of murder for their role in eight mob killings, including that of Anthony D. Lopi. Salvatore de Simone Salvatore, Sally Bo de Simone, sometimes spelled de Simone, died October 2018, was a soldier and former capo. His son Anthony was a member of the Tanglewood Boys. In 1994, his son Anthony went into hiding after the murder of Louis Balancio. In 1999, his son Anthony turned himself into the police and was sentenced in 2000 to 25 years to life. In 2005, the FBI revealed that De Simone and Lucchese soldier Daniel Ladella had meetings in doctor's offices with Gambino family Capo Greg de Palma. His son Anthony De Simone served seven years in prison before the conviction was overturned. He later pleaded guilty to manslaughter in 2010 and served no additional time. De Simone's other son Andrew De Simone became a made member in the Lucchese family. Salvatore De Simone died in October 2018. Christopher Fernari Christopher, Christy Tick Fernari, Sr., April 30, 1924, May 28, 2018, was a former consigliere until his 1986 racketeerian conviction. He was sentenced to 100 years in prison before being released in 2014 after serving almost 28 years. In 1924, Christopher Fernari was born in New York to first-generation Sicilian-Italian emigrants from Fernari, a commune in the province of Messina in Sicily. By age 15, Fernari was managing his own loan shark operations in Brooklyn and northern New Jersey. By 1943, the 19-year-old Fernari had already served two prison terms for armed robbery. Fernari was also sentenced to 15 to 30 years after he and several other youths were arrested with three girls in a car and charged with rape. In 1956, Fernari was released from prison on parole. Fernari became an associate of Gaetano, Tommy Three Finger Brown, Lucchese's crime family through Fernari's connection with mobster Anthony Corallo. During the late 1950s, Fernari became involved in illegal gambling and loan sharking. Fernari soon became an influential member of the Brooklyn faction of the family and was earning $25,000 a day. In 1962, at age 38, Fernari became a made man in the Lucchese family. In 1964, Fernari became a Cooper regime. The Lucchese power base was traditionally in Manhattan and the Bronx. The family's birthplace, the family's first three bosses, Gaetano, Tom Reina, Tommaso, Tommy Galliano, and Thomas Lucchese, were all from this area. In contrast, Fernari belonged to the less influential Brooklyn faction. Fernari operated his crew in Bensonhurst at the 19th Hole, a nondescript bar and mob social club. His crew was involved in illegal gambling, loan sharking, extortion, burglary, narcotics stealing, occasional murder contracts, and union and construction rackets. At this time, Fernari's criminal record included convictions for assault and sex offenses. Fernari controlled New York District Council 9, which represented 6,000 workers who painted and decorated hotels, bridges, and subway stations in New York. Fernari managed the council through the union secretary and treasurer, James Bishop, and Bishop's associate, Frank Arnold. Bishop and Arnold would pick up cash payments from the contractors, who charged a 10 to 15 percent tax on all major commercial painting jobs, and passed the payments to Fernari. The 19th hole, Fernari's social club, was the hub of criminal activity in Bensonhurst. Mobsters from every New York crime family conducted business in the club and socialized over food and drink. In the mid-1960s, aspiring mobsters Vittorio, Vic, Amuso and Anthony, Gaspipe, Casso joined Fernari's crew. In 
Fernari saw that both men could make money and were willing to use violence if needed. Fernari put Amuso and Casso in charge of a large bookmaking operation and debt collecting operation. In 1967, family boss Thomas Lucchese died of a brain tumor, leaving the family to be run by an interim boss, Carmen, Mr. Gribbs Tramonti. Lucchese's real successor, Anthony, Tony Dox Corallo, was convicted of bribery in 1967 and sentenced in 1968 to prison for two years. Tramonti served as acting boss, even after Corallo was released from prison in 1970. In 1973, with Tramonti's imprisonment, Corallo finally became the official Lucchese boss. In the early 1970s, the five families of New York organized crime decided to open the books, allowing a new generation of mob associates to become made men. Fernari immediately sponsored Amuso and Casso for family membership and then made them overseers of the Bypass Gang, a highly successful burglary ring. During the 1970s and 1980s, the Bypass Gang reportedly stole hundreds of millions of dollars in cash, jewelry, and other merchandise. In January 1972, Fernari backed and sanctioned a squad of armed robbers who took the famed Pierre Hotel in Manhattan under siege and stole approximately $3 million in jewels and cash. The Pierre Hotel robbery stands as the largest unrecovered hotel robbery in history. None of the perpetrators ever confessed to the heist and only a diamond necklace valued at $780,000 was recovered. The case was never solved. The eight brazen armed robbers were Robert Comfort, Sammy Nallo, Donald, Tony the Greek, Al Green, Ali Ben, Bobby Germain, and Al Visconti. In 1980, Fernari was promoted to consigliere in the Lucchese family. He wanted Casso to take over as capo of the 19th whole crew, but Casso declined and endorsed Amuso instead. Casso opted to become Fernari's aide. A consigliere is allowed to have one soldier work directly for him. Fernari now enjoyed enormous influence both within his own family, the other New York families, and crime families from other U.S. cities. Fernari continued to oversee his criminal interests from the 19th hole, but spent much of his time providing advice and mediation for family members as well as settling disputes with the other families. Fernari reigned as one of New York's top mafia bosses throughout the early 1980s until his 1985 racketeering indictment. On February 25, 1985, Fernari was indicted in the Mafia Commission case, the most comprehensive racketeer-influenced and corrupt organizations act, RICO, prosecution brought against the mob at the time. Fernari was indicted as a result of a Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, probe that used undercover surveillance and bugging techniques against the mob leaders. The bug that snared Fernari had been placed in Salvatore Avellino's Jaguar car. FBI surveillance recorded Corallo conducting business with Fernari and other family leaders. Pleading not guilty to the charges, Fernari was released on $1.75 million bail pending trial. In early 1986, while Fernari was awaiting the commission trial, the Lucchese family uncovered a new, potentially lucrative racket. A Russian American crime family based in Brighton Beach in Brooklyn run by Ukrainian immigrant Marat Balagola, had started to bootleg gasoline. By collecting gasoline taxes from customers and then not paying them to the government, Balagola was making very large profits. When Colombo crime family capo Michael Franzi started pressing Balagola for extortion payments, Balagola went to Fernari for help. Casso later reported on a meeting at the 19th hole, in which Fernari told Balagola, here there's enough for everybody to be happy, to leave the table satisfied. What we must avoid is trouble between us and the other families. I propose to make a deal with the others so there's no bad blood. Meanwhile, we will send word out that from now on you and your people are with the Lucchese family. No one will bother you. If anyone does bother you, come to us and Anthony will take care of it. As a result of the 19th whole meeting, the five families imposed a two cent per gallon family tax on Balagala's bootlegging operation, 
which became their greatest moneymaker after drug trafficking. According to one former associate, the LCN reminded Marat of the apparatchiks in the Soviet Union. He thought as long as he gave them something they would be valuable allies. Then all of a sudden he was at risk of being killed if he couldn't pay to the penny. According to author Philip Carlo, it didn't take long for word on the street to reach the Russian underworld. Marat Balagala was paying off the Italians. Balagala was a punk. Balagala had no balls. Balagala's days were numbered. This, of course, was the beginning of serious trouble. Balagala did in fact have balls. He was a ruthless killer when necessary, but he also was a smart diplomatic administrator and he knew that the combined, concerted force of the Italian crime families would quickly wipe the newly arrived Russian competition off the proverbial map. On June 12, 1986, one of Balagala's rivals, Russian gangster Vladimir Reznikov, entered Balagala's nightclub in Brighton Beach. Reznikov pushed a 9mm Beretta handgun against Balagala's skull and demanded $600,000 and a percentage of Balagala's rackets. After Balagala acceded to his demands, Reznikov told him, Fuck with me and you're dead, you and your whole fucking family. I swear I'll fucking kill your wife as you watch. You understand? After Reznikov left the nightclub, Balagala suffered a massive heart attack. He insisted, however, on being treated at his home in Brighton Beach, where he felt safer. At home, Balagala asked Casso to come help him. Casso gave these instructions to Balagala. Send word to Vladimir that you have his money, that he should come to the club tomorrow. We'll take care of the rest. Casso also requested a photograph of Reznikov and a description of his car. The next day, Reznikov arrived at Balagala's nightclub to pick up his money. Lucchese soldier Joseph Testa confronted Reznikov and fatally shot him. According to Casso, after that, Marat didn't have any problems with other Russians. In September 1986, Farinari went on trial in the famous New York Mafia Commission case along with Corallo and underboss Salvatore, Tom Mix Santoro. The charges included extortion and labor racketeering within the construction industry and murder for hire of former Bonanno crime family boss Carmine Lilo Gulanti. Gulanti had been gunned down on July 12, 1979 allegedly on the orders of the commission. Some have argued that Fernari wasn't on the commission then and had no connection with the Galanti hit. However, Fernari could not use this as a defense argument. By the fall of 1986, Corallo realized that he, Santoro and Fernari would not only be convicted, but were facing sentences that would all but assure they would die in prison. Fernari persuaded Corallo that either Amuso or Caso should become the new boss. At a meeting in Fernari's home, Fernari, Amuso and Caso all agreed that Amuso should succeed Corallo as boss. On November 19, 1986 Fernari was convicted on all counts, including the Galanti murder. On January 13, 1987, Fernari was sentenced to 100 years in prison without parole and fined $240. 000. With the imprisonment of Corallo and Fernari, Amuso became boss, and Caso became consigliere and later underboss. Peter, Fat Pete Chiodo took over Fernari's Bensonhurst crew. In 1990, Amuso and Caso became fugitives to avoid prosecution in the famous Windows case. In 1992, Amuso was captured and sentenced to life in prison. In 1993, Caso was also captured, however, in 1994 he struck a deal with the government to testify against Fernari and other family leaders. In 1995, Fernari started challenging the no parole stipulation of his sentence in court. The government had previously revoked Caso's witness deal with prosecutors, and in 1996 Caso was sentenced to life in prison. Fernari's lawyers insisted that Caso's court testimony against Fernari was tainted. In July 2000, the Third Circuit Federal Court of Appeals ruled that the parole board officials had been denying Fernari's parole eligibility on the tainted assertions of mob turncoat Caso. However, 
In 2001, the Bureau of Prisons National Appeal Board ruled that Fernari was a multiple murderer and was not eligible for parole, based on what some people considered to be Casso's discredited testimony. On February 15, 2006, Fernari filed a habeas corpus petition in district court claiming that the United States Parole Commission improperly had denied him parole. On June 20, 2007, the court denied his petition. Fernari was imprisoned in the Allenwood Medium Federal Correctional Institution, FCI, in Allenwood, Pennsylvania. His projected release date was November 24, 2044, effectively a life sentence. However, since he was convicted before Congress eliminated parole for federal prisoners, he and his co-defendants became eligible for parole in 1996. Fernari was the only defendant to be granted early release by the U.S. Parole Commission, most likely relating to the weak evidence behind his murder conviction. Fernari was released from a prison hospital in Minnesota on September 19, 2014 after serving 28 years. On May 28, 2018, Fernari died at his home in Staten Island, New York. Stefano Lasalle Stefano Steve Lasalle, real name Lasalle, was an early member of the Murillo family. He later joined Reina's family. In 1915, East Harlem's Italian lottery King Joe Sugalucci was murdered, allowing Lasalle and Tommaso Lomonti to take over the lottery games. Lasalle served as underboss to Thomas Lucchese and later Carmine Tremonti, until he retired in the 1970s. Anthony Loria Sr. Anthony Tony Loria Sr., also known as Tony Abu Damida, was a mobster who played a major role in the French Connection heroin scandal. Loria, along with his longtime partner Vincent Papa and his crew, are known as the men who stole the French Connection. Loria was known to federal agents and the BNDD as a major drug trafficker within the Lucchese crime family. He was convicted in 1961 of trafficking heroin, but his conviction was overturned on appeal in 1968 because of violations of the Fourth Amendment. He was implicated along with Papa, Anthony Passero, Virgil Alessi and Frank Diamato in the New York Police Department scandal, in which over $70 million worth of drugs seized during the French Connection operation was stolen from the police property room. The crew stole 398 pounds of heroin and 120 pounds of cocaine from 1969 to 1972. In October 1973, Loria was indicted along with the boss of the Lucchese family Carmine Tremonti and 42 other mobsters, on drug dealing charges. He died in 1989 from natural causes. Joseph Lucchese Joseph, Joe Brown Lucchese was a capo and brother to Tommy Lucchese, the boss of the Lucchese crime family. He controlled gambling operations along with Aniello Milior. In 1963, during the Valachi hearings, Lucchese was identified as a capo in the Lucchese family. He died during the early 1970s. Anthony Luongo Anthony Buddy Luongo was a former capo. In 1986, Luongo tried to take over the Lucchese crime family after boss Anthony Corello was imprisoned during the commission case. In December 1986, Luongo met Vic Amuso. Anthony Castle, Bobby Amuso and Dom Carbucci in Brooklyn, where Bobby Amuso shot Luongo dead. Mariano Macaluso Mariano Mac Macaluso, born June 7, 1912, was a former member. He served as consigliere during the 1960s. In 1986, after the Mafia Commission trial, Macaluso became the new underboss. In 1989, Boss Vic Amuso forced him into retirement. In 1992, he died from natural causes. Frank Manzo Frank Manzo, February 2, 1925, October 23, 2012, also known as Francesco Manzo, Frank Mance, and Frankie the Wop was a soldier in the Vario crew who oversaw the family's interests at John F. Kennedy International Airport, JFK, in Queens.
New York. He served as a union delegate in the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America, controlled Local 295 and owned two trucking companies, LVF Air Cargo, Inc., and LVF Airport Service, Inc. at JFK Airport. Manzo also owned Villa Capra, a restaurant in Cedarhurst, New York, where he conducted illegal activities. In 1972, Manzo was kidnapped by James McBratney, Eddie Maloney, Tommy Genovese, and Richie Chason. They held him for $150,000 in ransom, then released him when it was paid. In 1983, Manzo was overheard in an FBI wiretap, saying, We rule this airport. In 1985, Manzo along with Local 295 President Frank Kalis, Local 851 Vice President Harry Davidoff, and others were indicted on charges of extorting shipping and trucking companies at JFK Airport. In 1986, Manzo pleaded guilty to racketeering and was sentenced to 12 years in prison and fined $325,000. On April 8, 1987, Manzo was banned from New Jersey casinos due to his history of involvement with organized crime. Manzo was released from prison in 1994. In 1995, Manzo was charged with racketeering for extorting $2 million in payoffs from cement company owner John Quadrazzi over a 13 year period between 1978 and 1991. However, the charges were dropped when the judge ruled that the crimes were covered under his 1986 plea agreement. On October 23, 2012, Manzo died in his sleep. Aniello Miliar Aniello Neil Miliar, October 1933, September 11, 2019, was a made man. He served as a capo as the consigliere, as the underboss and on a ruling panel in the family. Miller was a close associate of family bosses Tommy Lucchese and Anthony Corallo. Miller was born in October 1933 in Queens, New York. He was recruited into Lucchese family by Capo Joseph Laratro, who controlled illegal gambling operations in Corona, Queens. By the late 1950s Miller, a soldier, already was overseeing Laratro's illegal gambling operations from bookmaking, policy operations and large telephone setups. In 1957, it was reported that after paying tribute to his boss, Millior was making $50,000 a day from running illegal gambling operations in New York City. On November 14, 1957, Millior was suspected of driving boss Tommy Lucchese and under boss Steve LaSalle to the famous Appalachian meeting, a national Cosa Nostra summit in Appalachian, New York that was broken up by law enforcement. The next day on November 15, 1957 Millior was in a car accident while driving through Binghamton, New York leading to more suspicion that he was supposed to attend the Appalachian meeting. Oh, on October 22, 1974, Millior was indicted, along with members Frank Altimari, Nicholas Bonaina, Anthony Romanello, Frank Ruggiero, Richard Rubino, Thomas DeMeo, brothers Michael Struzieri and William Struzieri, and NYPD police officer James Maxwell, on bribery charges in order to protect a gambling operation in Queens. Millier as a couple represented the family's interest in Northbury Concrete, a Brooklyn-based contractor and member of the New York City's Concrete Club. He also held a salesman position with Port Dock and Stone, one of the main suppliers of trap rock to the two companies that controlled the production of concrete in New York City. On March 21, 1986, Millier was indicted along with Genovese family acting boss Anthony Salerno. Genovese family captains Vincent Caffaro, Vincent de Napoli and Giuseppe Sabato, Genovese family members Louis de Napoli, Carmine Gelacava and Thomas Caffaro, and Cleveland family members John Tronalone and Milton Rockman, Gambino family member Alphonse Mosqua, and four businessmen, Edward J. Halloran, Nicholas Aletta, Alvin Ochatin, and Richard Costa, 
on extortion and bid rigging charges. The charges alleged Millior and other mobsters had rigged the bidding process for the supplying of concrete to high rise building projects in Manhattan, such as the Trump Plaza and sites for Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. In November 1986, the New York Times reported Millior, a captain and owner of a Queen's Marble business who also controlled gambling operations with Joe Lucchese, the brother of former boss Thomas Lucchese, replaced Anthony Corallo as the new boss of the Lucchese family, after Corallo was convicted during the commission trial. Former Lucchese mobster Alphonse Diarco revealed that Vicamuso Musso was chosen as the new family boss and Millior served as consigliere before being replaced by Anthony Castle when Millior went to prison. On May 4, 1988, Millior was convicted was sentenced to 24 years in prison and fined $266.000.in 1991. Millier's conviction was overturned and he was released from prison. Millier held an on-the-book job as a sales representative with a trap rock supplier in the concrete business. On April 3, 1992, Millior was celebrating the birthday of a friend's granddaughter at Tesoro's restaurant in Westbury, Long Island. During the party, a shooter in a passing car fired shotgun blasts through the restaurant window. Millier was struck in the neck and upper body. Despite his wounds, Millior survived. On May 14, 1997, Millior was released from prison. In 2003, it was reported by author Jerry K. Pesci that the Lucchese crime family was being run by a three man ruling committee consisting of Millior, Matthew Madonna, and Joseph DiNapoli in the absence of an acting boss. Millier, who served as underboss in the past to Anthony Corello, was considered the biggest influence on the ruling committee. Millier died on September 11, 2019. Richard Pagliarolo Richard II Pagliarolo, November 30, 1948. 1999 was a former capo who took over as capo of Peter Chiodo's old Bensonhurst crew. In 1991, Pagliarolo served as a member of a panel that conducted a Lucchese crime family induction ceremony in Howard Beach, Queens. He sponsored both Gregory Whitey Capello and Jody Calabrese for membership during the ceremony. In the late 1990s, Pagliarolo died of natural causes in prison. Vincent Papa Vincent C. Papa, 1917, July 1977, was a former maid member in the family who became notorious for masterminding the theft of the French Connection heroin from the New York Police Department, NYPD, property office. Papa grew up in Astoria, Queens and owned a tire company in the neighborhood. He had been arrested 28 times. Two of the arrests were on drug charges. Papa ran his criminal operations from Dittmer's Car Service, in Astoria, Queens, and from the Astoria Colt Social Club. He worked closely with mobsters Anthony Loria and Virgil Alessi. Between 1969 and 1972, New York Police Department detectives James Farley, Joseph Nunziata, Frank King and others were paid by Papa to steal approximately $70 million in confiscated narcotics heroin from the New York City Police Property Clerk's Office in Lower Manhattan. Papa was arrested on February 3, 1972, in a car parked on Bronxdale Avenue with Joseph DiNapoli in the back seat. There was a suitcase with $967,500 in $100 bills. In 1975, Papa was convicted and sent to the Atlanta Federal Prison in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1977, Papa was stabbed to death in prison. He is buried in St. John's Cemetery in Queens. Papa's infamous theft became famous after the movie French Connection 2. Joseph Pinzolo Bonaventura Joseph Pinzolo, 1887, September 5, 1930, also known as Fat Joe, was the boss of the family during 1930. In July 1908, Pinzello was arrested for trying to bomb 314 East 11th Street in an effort to force owner Francisco Spinelli to pay black hand extortion demands. After his arrest Pinzolo, 
gave up his boss Giuseppe Costabile, a Camarista who controlled the area south of Houston Street to Canal Street and from East Broadway to the East River. Benzello served two years and eight months to five years after refusing to testify against Costabile. In February 1930, Gaetano Reina was murdered and boss Joseph Masria backed Benzello to take control of the Reina family. Pinzolo may have been responsible for Reina's murder, though the most widely suspected culprit for that crime remains Vito Genovese. As boss Pinzolo was unfamiliar with the members of the family in the East Harlem area, his promotion angered Tommaso Galliano, Tommy Lucchese and Dominic Petrilli, who formed a splinter group within the family and planned his murder. On September 5, 1930, Pinzolo's body was found in the Brokaw building on 1487 Broadway in Suite 1007 occupied by California dry fruit importers. The office was leased by Tommy Lucchese four months earlier. According to Joseph Valici, the killer was Girolamo Santuccio. Valici also mentioned that after Pinzolo's assassination, a meeting was held on Staten Island to uncover who is responsible for the murder. Vincenzo Rao Vincenzo John Rao, June 21, 1898 Palermo, Sicily, September 25, 1988, also known as Vincent or Vinny, was a former consigliere in the family. His father was Antonio Rao and his mother Laboria Galliano. He had a brother Calogero, Charles, and a sister Maria Speciale. On his mother's side, Rao was a distant relative to Tommaso Galliano. He was a cousin to gangster Joseph Rao. He married Carmelina Alberti and the couple had two daughters, Nina Vento and Libaria Pancaldo. On December 5, 1921, Vincenzo Rao became a naturalized United States citizen in New York City. He began his criminal career working for the Galeanos in East Harlem. Rao became a powerful mobster in the lading industry. He became partners in Five Borough Hoisting Company. United Lathing Company, Westchester Lathing Corporation and Ace Lathing Company operating from the Bronx and Westchester. In the 1950s, boss Gaetano Lucchese promoted Rao to consigliere in the family. In 1957, Rao was arrested with 60 other mobsters at the abortive Appalachian meeting in rural Appalachian, New York. When asked by investigators why he was at the meeting, Rao said he went there for the luncheon buffet and did not speak to anyone else because he was not introduced. During the 1963 Valachi hearings, Rao was listed as the Lucchese family's consigliere. In 1965, Rao was convicted on perjury charges and was sentenced to five years in prison. At the same time the longtime boss Thomas Lucchese had become ill and Rao was thought as suitable successor. His chance to become the new boss never came to fruition due to his trials. During the early 1970s, Rao retired. On September 25, 1988, Rao died of natural causes and is buried at Farncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. Salvatore Santoro Salvatore T. Tom Mix Santoro, Sr., November 18, 1915. January 2000 served as underboss in the Lucchese crime family during the 1980s before being convicted in the Mafia Commission trial and sentenced to 100 years in federal prison. He was born in Leonia, New Jersey to Antonio and Teresa Bargio. He married Mary Zangaglia but did not father any children. He is the uncle to Lucchese family soldier and union boss Anthony Di Lopi. He earned the nickname Tom Mix because in his younger years he closely resembled the Dutch-German-American Western film actor by that name. Santoro started working for the Galliano crime family, forerunner of the Lucchese family, in the early 1930s. He served as an associate of future boss Tommy, Three Finger Brown, Lucchese's 107th Street Gang in operating extortion, loan sharking, narcotics and prostitution ring during the 1930s. He was made sometime in the 1940s operating drug trafficking and loan sharking rings. On July 6, 
1942, Santoro received six months to two years in prison after pleading guilty to conspiring to import narcotics from Mexico. In March 1951, Santoro was indicted on charges of conspiracy to import opium from Mexico and convert it into heroin. Santoro went into hiding and allegedly spent time in Europe before returning to Oyster Bay, New York. On September 24, 1951, he surrendered to federal authorities in New York City. On January 7, 1952, after pleading guilty to narcotics charges, a judge labeled Santoro as a bad fellow and sentenced him to four years in prison. In 1951 or 1953, longtime boss Tommy Galliano died. Under boss Tommy Lucchese took over what was now called the Lucchese crime family. Lucchese then promoted Santoro to capo of the family's powerful Bronx faction. As Capo Santoro operated out of East Harlem and the Bronx controlling large heroin drug trafficking operations during the 1950s. In 1958 he was arrested and tried for narcotics charges. He was alleged to be a partner and associate of Ellsworth Johnson, although this never was confirmed. Santoro was convicted of all charges in 1959 and was given a 20-year prison sentence. When Santoro was released from prison in 1978, he took over as underboss, continuing to oversee the powerful Bronx faction of the family. He left the drug trade alone and instead took over the labor and construction racketeering operations for the family in New York City. Santoro gained a reputation as a labor racketeer and worked with consigliere Christopher Farnari and other top capos in the family. He bought a home on City Island Avenue in City Island, Bronx. In the early 1980s, Anthony Corallo found a new way to discuss business without ever meeting his top underlings Santoro and Farnari. Corallo used his Jaguar with a phone inside and talked to mostly Santoro on the phone while he was driving around in New York with his chauffeur Aniello Miliore. They succeeded mostly because the noise of the old Jaguar was so loud that it was not possible to hear what Corallo and others were saying. However, after the Jaguar came with a new engine and new filter, Federal Bureau of Investigation agents planted a bug in it and listened into Corallo's conversations with Santoro, mostly about the profit from the labor and construction racketeering operations in the Bronx, where they extorted unions and had influence in the construction industry. As U.S. law enforcement undertook a concerted effort to crush organized crime activities in New York City during the mid-1980s, they put 11 top members of the five families, including the entire leadership of the Lucchese crime family, Corallo, Santoro and Consigliere Christopher, Christy Tick, Farinari, on trial, called the Mafia Commission trial or the Commission case. The defendants were arrested on February 25, 1985 on various charges, including labor racketeering, extortion, loan sharking, illegal gambling and murder. The trial began in September 1986. The charges also involved the execution of Bonanno crime family de facto boss Carmine Galanti in 1979, allegedly on the orders of the commission because they saw Galanti as a potential rival who planned to take over all organized crime operations in the New York area. On November 19, 1986, Santoro and the other defendants were convicted on all counts. On January 13, 1987, Santoro was sentenced to 100 years in prison and fined $250.000. In January 2000, Santoro died at age 87 of natural causes at a medical center for federal prisoners. Months later Corallo died in August 2000. Patrick Testa Patrick Patty Testa is a former soldier. Testa was the younger brother to Joseph Testa. In 1984, he was indicted on fraud and theft charges along with members of the Gambino family's Demio crew. Testa was sentenced to two years in prison and after his release joined the Lucchese crime family. On December 2, 1992, Testa was murdered, shot in the back of the head nine times. It was later revealed that Anthony Casso had ordered Frank Los Torino to murder Tesla. Anthony Tortorello Anthony Torti Tortorello a former capo of the 
Prince Street Crew. In 1986, Tortorello was overheard by Genovese Mobster asking why Vincent Giganti was upset by drug deals when Giganti himself profited from drug deals. When Giganti heard these statements demand Tortorello's death, but Anthony Casso was able to save his life by planning a phony beating of Tortorello to appeal Giganti demand. In October 1991, Tortorello along with Frank Los Torino, Anthony Baratta, Salvatore Avellino, Richard Pagliarolo, George Conte, Thomas Anzelato and Frank Papani inducted made Joseph Tortorello, Thomas D'Ambrosia, Frank Joy Jr., Gregory Capello and Jody Calabrese into the crime family during a ceremony that was held in the Howard Beach, Queens home. Tortorello sponsored his son Joseph, Torty Jr. During the ceremony, his son Joseph, Torty Jr., later went on to control a drug operation in Lower Manhattan. In late 2000, Tortorello died in a Kentucky prison. Dominic Trussello Dominic, Crazy Dom Trussello, April 29, 1934, July 2018, was the couple of the Prince Street crew. In the 1990s, Trussello along with Stephen Cree and Joseph Tangora formed the Lucchese Construction Group, supervising all the Lucchese family's construction-related rackets. On September 6, 2000, Trussello was indicted along with acting boss Stephen Cree, Capo Joseph Tangora, soldiers Joseph Ditello, Philip Desimone, Arthur Zambardi, Anthony Petzullo, and Joseph Troncale on labor racketeering, extortion, and bid rigging charges. In September 2002, Trussello and Stephen Cree were indicted on information supplied by Joseph Daffy D, who became a government witness in February. The indictment charged Trussello with extorting Commercial Brick, a construction company. In October 2003, Trussello pleaded guilty to federal extortion charges. On January 9, 2006, Trussello was released from prison. On May 31, 2017, Trussello along with street boss Matthew Madonna, under boss Stephen Cree Sr., Consigliere Joseph Di Napoli and other members of the family were indicted and charged with racketeering, murder, narcotics, cocaine, heroin, marijuana, prescribed medication, and firearms offenses. Trussello died during the trial in July 2018. Past Associate S. Guido Pinossi Guido, the bull, Pinossi a former associate. He lived in Beverly Hills and was a narcotics dealer active in Los Angeles and the West Coast. In the 1980s, Pinossi, along with his cousin Frank Piccolo, a member in the Gambino crime family, stopped Genovese family mobsters from extorting his friend Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton v. NBC. Abraham Talvi Abraham Abe Talvi, September 12, 1934, July 28, 1956, was an associate of Johnny Dio. In 1956, Talvi was ordered by Dio to throw acid on New York journalist Victor Riesel for making radio and television appearances about labor union corruption. In the morning of April 5th, 1956, Talvi attacked Victor Riesel as he was leaving Lindy's, a Broadway restaurant, throwing sulfuric acid onto his face leaving him permanently blind. In the attack, Talvi had burned himself badly on the right side of his face and neck with some of the acid that splashed on him. He was paid $1,175 in cash and began demanding more money from Dio. On July 28th, 1956, Telvi was found dead on Mulberry Street with a bullet in his head. Vincent Zito Vincent Zito, 1941, October 26, 2018, is a former loan shark and associate of the Lucchese family. Zito was found dead in his sheep shed bay, Brooklyn home on October 26, 2018 after being shot twice in the head. According to police Zito was arrested for loan sharking in the past and has been tied to the Lucchese family. His elder brother Anthony Zito was arrested in 1971 for extortion and has also been linked with the Lucchese family. On March 7, 
2019 Anthony Pandrella, a Gambino family associate, was indicted for the murder of Vincent Zito. The indictment claimed Anthony Pandrella, a longtime friend of Zito, murdered him and stole his loan shark in business. Government informants and witnesses Peter Chiodo Peter, Fat Pete Chiodo, 1951-2016, was a capo in the Lucchese crime family who later became a government witness. In 1987, Chiodo became a made man in the Lucchese family in a ceremony held in an apartment over a funeral home in Queens. In 1989, Chiodo became a capo in charge of funneling payoffs from local 580 of the Iron Workers Union to the Lucchese leadership. He was known as Fat Pete because of his enormous girth 400 pounds, 180 kilograms, to 500 pounds, 230 kilograms. Depending on the source. In 1989, the Lucchese family began worrying about indictments from the Windows case. The Lucchese's and three other New York families had participated in a window replacement scheme that stole millions of dollars from the New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA. Worried that construction union leader John Morrissey might testify for the prosecution, family leaders ordered Chiodo to lure Morrissey to New Jersey, where he was murdered. In 1991, Chiodo was charged with violations of the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act RICO, in the Windows case. Chiodo realized that the government's case was so solid that he would likely die in prison if convicted. He decided to plead guilty in return for a lighter sentence. However, Chiodo did not ask Lucchese official boss Vittorio, Vic, Amuso and official underboss Anthony, Gaspipe, Casso for permission to take a plea. Amuso and Casso were both in hiding due to the Windows case. Suspecting Chiodo was about to turn informer, Amuso and Casso ordered him killed. Casso gave the contract to acting boss Alphonse, Little Al, D'Arco. The order shocked D'Arco, who knew that Chiodo had been a close confidant of Casso for years. On May 8, 1991 two shooters ambushed Chiodo at a gas station in Staten Island where he was working on a car. Chiodo received 12 bullet wounds in the arms, legs, and torso, but survived the attack. Doctors credited Chiodo's massive girth for saving his life. None of the slugs penetrated a vital organ or artery. However, he suffered several abdominal wounds in the disabled right arm. Chiodo had anticipated that he was in Amuso and Casso's bad books. He knew that Amuso and Casso had a habit of marking guys rats and killing them. Just before the hit, he told Diargo that he'd gotten word that you and I are going to be killed and hurt. Following the unsuccessful assassination attempt, Lucchese mobsters delivered a blunt threat to Chiodo's lawyer that they would kill Chiodo's wife if he testified, a violation of a long-standing mafia rule against harming women. While Chiodo had turned down several offers to flip, the threat against his wife was the last straw. He opted to break his blood oath and become a government witness, by his own account, to protect his family. The government quickly brought Chiodo's immediate family into the Federal Witness Protection Program. With the failure of his gunman to murder Chiodo, D'Arco soon became afraid of the wrath of his bosses. After a 1991 meeting during which he feared being murdered, D'Arco went into hiding and soon became a government witness himself. In September 1991, using the wheelchair due to his wounds, Chiodo testified in the Windows trial. Chiodo stated that he had undergone a transformation from a violent criminal to a man with a conscience. When asked what prompted this transformation, Chiodo replied, I was shot 12 times. Chiodo's remaining family in Brooklyn soon suffered retaliation from the Lucchese's. On March 10, 1992, Lucchese associate Michael Spinelli shot Patricia Capozallo, Chiodo's sister, while she was driving in Bensonhurst. Capozallo suffered wounds to the arm, back and neck but survived. On February 2, 1993, the body of Frank Sinorino. Chiodo's uncle was found in the trunk of a car in East New York.
The body displayed several gunshot wounds to the head. Chiodo provided valuable evidence that helped convict both Amuso and Castle as well as many other gangsters. While testifying in different cities, the government had to fly Chiodo in a special plane due to his morbid obesity. In July 1997, Chino testified against Genovese crime family boss Vincent Giganti in another Windows-related racketeering trial. Oh, on September 11, 2007, Chiodo was sentenced to 17 years in prison on racketeering charges. However, due to his testimony, Chiodo was to serve no time in prison and was placed in the witness protection program. Peter Chiodo died in January 2016, aged 65 of natural causes. Joseph Diarco Joseph, Little Joe Diarco is a former soldier who is currently in witness protection along with his father former acting boss Alphonse Diarco. In early 1990, Vic Amuso and Anthony Castle ordered Diarco to kill Anthony Di Lopi, a soldier who was in hiding. On February 4, 1990, he shot Di Lopi to death in his Hollywood, California apartment building's underground garage. In September 1991, Diarco's father became a marked man, being targeted for death, and, fearing for his own life, surrendered to the FBI and agreed to become a witness. Joseph to feed Joseph, Little Joe to feed, 1934. July 15, 2012, was a former New York City mobster and acting boss of the Lucchese crime family who eventually turned informant. Born in 1934, Defeat grew up in the Queens borough of New York City. In his early days, he operated a hot dog vendor truck in Coney Island, Brooklyn, running numbers rackets on the side. A close friend and handball partner of Lucchese leader Vittorio Vic Amuso, Defeat was inducted into the family in 1986 after Amuso became boss. Defeat's rise and fall in the New York mob can all be attributed to Amuso. In 1994, Amuso was convicted of federal racketeering and murder charges and sent to prison for life. Amuso then named Defeat his acting boss to replace Alphonse Diarco with a weaker and more controllable man at the top after Diarco became a government witness. On April 28, 1998, Defeat was indicted on nine counts of racketeering stemming from his supervision of the family rackets in New York's Garment District from 1991 to 1996. The prosecution reported that the Lucchese family had been grossing $40,000 per month from Garment District businesses since the mid-1980s. In December 1998, Defeat pleaded guilty to the charges and received five years in prison. During the late 90s, Amuso's relationship with Defeat began to sour. Suspecting that Defeat was hiding money from the family, Amuso replaced him as acting boss with Stephen Cree, head of the family's powerful Bronx faction. Once Cree took over, family profits rose enormously. That was enough to convince Amuso that Defeat had been skimming profits. Amuso reportedly decided to have him murdered. On February 5, 2002, Defeat was released from a Lexington, Kentucky prison medical center. Having heard of Amuso's plans to kill him, Defeat immediately became a government informant. Defeat provided details concerning the garment district rackets and the protection rackets in Howard Beach, Queens. He also provided information leading to the convictions of Cree, Louis Dadone, Dominic Trussello, Joseph Tangora, Anthony Barata, and a number of family captains, soldiers and associates. While testifying against Gambino crime family boss Peter Gotti, Defeat testified that he only earned $1,014,000, or approximately $250,000 per year. During his tenure as acting boss, Defeat also estimated that a low-ranking family soldier would make on average $50,000 per year. Defeat entered and left the witness protection program, moving to live in Florida under an assumed name. He and his wife reportedly lived on $30,000 a year and a modest annuity provided by the U.S. Marshals Service, their assets having been depleted by legal bills and the cost of creating new identities. On July 15, 2012, Defeat died from a heart attack.
Donald Franco's Donald, Tony the Greek, George Franco's, born November 10, 1938 Hackensack, New Jersey, died March 30, 2011 Danamora, New York, was a Greek-Italian contract killer and mob associate of the Lucchese family, who later became a government witness. His father George Argiri Frango left his hometown of Cardamila on Chios, Greece in 1905 as a crewman on a ship. George Frango married Irene, an immigrant from Syracuse, Italy and had three children, Georgia, 1932, James, 1935 and Donald, 1938. In 1974, Franco's murdered Lucchese associate Richard Bellello. In 1992, Franco's claim to author William Hoffman he took part in the murder of Jimmy Hoffa, with a hit team consisting of himself, and Irish-American mobsters John Sullivan and James Coonan. According to Franco's, Hoffa was lured by his close friend Chucky O'Brien to a house owned by Detroit mobster Anthony Jacalone. Once there, Hoffa was shot and killed by Kunin and Franco's using suppressed .22 pistols. Hoffa was then dismembered by Kunin, Sullivan, and Franco's. It has been asserted that he sealed the body in an oil drum and buried it underneath Giant Stadium, however no evidence has ever been found to substantiate this claim. Author Jerry K. Pussy found these claims false because Franco's was in prison during Hoffa's disappearance. Eugene Yogenini Eugene Yogenini a former soldier who became an informant to the Bureau of Narcotics. In 1942, Janini was charged with heroin conspiracy and served 15 months in prison. He moved to Europe in 1950 and began smuggling U.S. medical supplies into Italy. While in Italy he formed a connection to Charles Luciano and began informing on Luciano to the Bureau of Narcotics. Giannini was arrested on counterfeiting charges in Italy but the charges were dropped and he moved back to New York. The Mafia in New York discovered that Giannini was an informer and ordered his murder. Genovese family capo Anthony, Tony Bender, Strollo gave the contract to Joseph Velici. On September 20, 1952, Giannini's body was found on 107th Street shot to death. Valigi later revealed he recruited brothers Joseph and Pasquale Pagano and Fiore Shano to carry out the hit. They murdered Giannini near a gambling club run by Lucchese family soldier Paul Coriel between 2nd Avenue and East 112th Street. Frank Joy Jr. Frank, Spaghetti Man Joy Jr., born August 10, 1967, is a former soldier who is currently in witness protection along with his father, Former soldier Frank Joya Sr. in 1991, Joya Jr. was inducted into the Lucchese crime family in a ceremony held in Howard Beach, Queens. He was sponsored by George Conte, who was filling in for his real sponsor George Zappola. In June 1992, Joya Jr. was arrested in Brooklyn on a gun charge. In 1993, Joya Jr. along with George Zappola and Frank Papani plotted to have Stephen Curry killed. In 1993, Joya was arrested for trafficking heroin from Manhattan to Boston. In 1994, Joya found out that Frank Papani planned to murder his father Frank Joya Sr., prompting the son to become a government witness. Since becoming a government witness, Joya Jr. has testified against 60 defendants. According to investigator Robert Anglin, of Phoenix, Arizona real estate developer, the individual known as Frank Capri is really former mob informant Frank Joya Jr. Since 2015, Capri and his company have been accused in multiple lawsuits for failing to pay rent and contractors and misappropriating funds meant to pay for construction. On February 5, 2020, Frank Capri and his mother Debbie Corvo were indicted on charges of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit money laundering in connection with the operation of various branded restaurant locations in Arizona and across the United States. The indictment charged Capri with the financial failure of Toby Keith and Rascal Flatts branded restaurants. Burton Kaplan Burton Kaplan was an associate and government informant. During the 1980s Kaplan was the go-between for Lucchese crime family under boss Anthony Casso and NYPD detectives Louis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa. In 2006, 
Kaplan was released from federal custody and his remaining 18-year sentence for marijuana trafficking was dropped in return for cooperating in the case against Apolito and Caracapa. In July 2009, Kaplan died from prostate cancer. John Panisi John Panisi is a former soldier who is currently in witness protection. In 2013, Panisi was made into the Lucchese family in a secret initiation ceremony in a basement of a Staten Island home by acting boss Matthew Madonna and capo John Castellucci. Panisi was a member of the Lucchese family's Brooklyn faction that now operated from Tottenville, Staten Island. In October 2018, Panisi started cooperating with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In May 2019, Government witness Penizzi testified in the trial against Eugene Castell and revealed the current leadership of the crime family. Penizzi testified that in 2017, the Brooklyn faction of the family wrote a letter to imprisoned boss Vic Amuso complaining about how the power had shifted to the Bronx. According to Penizzi's testimony, in prison for life boss Vic Amuso sent a letter to underboss Stephen Cree which stated that Brooklyn-based mobster Michael Big Mike DeSantis would take over as acting boss replacing Bronx-based Matthew Madonna. The testimony from Panisi stated that if the Bronx faction refused to step aside, in prison boss Amuso had approved of a hit list that included a captain and several members of the Bronx faction. During Panisi's testimony, he revealed that the Lucchese family operates with a total of seven crews, two in the Bronx, two on Long Island, one in Manhattan, one in New Jersey, and Castellucci's Brooklyn crew, formerly Amuso Casso's old crew which is now based in Tottenville section of Staten Island. Dominic Petrilli Dominic, The Gap, Petrilli was a former member. He got the nickname, The Gap, after losing two front teeth in a childhood fight. Petrilli met Joseph Valici in Sing Sing Prison in a signing, New York. In 1928, after Valaji was released from prison Petrilli introduced him to Girolama, Bobby Doyle, Santucci and Tom Galliano. In 1942, Petrilli was convicted on narcotic charges and was deported to Italy. In November 1953, he re-entered the U.S. and it was rumored he was working with the government. On December 9, 1953, he was murdered in a bar on East 183rd Street in the Bronx by three gunmen. Thomas Ricciardi Thomas, Tommy Boy Ricciardi is a former soldier who is currently in witness protection. Both Thomas and his brother Daniel were associated with the Lucchese family's New Jersey faction before becoming government informants. Ricciardi was a member of Michael Tichetta's inner circle and controlled the group's illegal gambling operations. In August 1988, Richardi along with his brother Daniel and 20 other members of the New Jersey faction were acquitted in a 21-month trial. On April 18, 1991, Richardi was indicted along with Michael Tuxetta, Anthony Axetchuro, Michael Perna on corruption charges. On August 13, 1993, they were all convicted of racketeering and both Thomas Ricciardi and Anthony Axetchuo agreed to become government witnesses and testified against Luxetta and Perna. On September 6, 2001, Ricciardi was released from prison after serving 10 years and is now currently in the witness protection program. Vincent Salinardi Vincent, Vinnie Baldi Salinardi is a former soldier who became a government informant. In 2002, Salinardi was indicted along with Consigliere Joseph Carini, Capo John Sarella and others. The group was charged with extorting the Hudson and McCoy Fish House restaurant in Freeport, Long Island. He began cooperating with the government and continued to collect money from a loan shark debt and was dropped from the witness protection program. In March 2006, Salinardi was sentenced to 11 years and 3 months in prison. Salinardi was released from prison on October 29, 2012. Frank Suppa Frank Gugu Suppa is a former soldier who is currently in witness protection. Suppa was a soldier in the Lucchese family's New Jersey faction operating in Florida as Anthony Axetero's right-hand man. In 1983, Suppa attended the sit-down along with Anthony Axetero, 
Michael Tuxella, Thomas Richard Ian's Philadelphia crime family mobsters Jackie, the Nose, DiNorcio and Joseph Alonzo over DiNorcio joining the Lucchese family. In 1993, Suppa was indicted along with others on charges that they conspired to distribute up to 1,650 pounds of cocaine in the United States. In December 1996, Suppa along with his son Anthony Suppa, Joseph Marino, David Detheridge and Stephen Cassone testified against Fabio Di Cristofaro and Irving Schwartz in the case of the murder of Joseph Martino. In 1997, Di Cristofaro and Schwartz received life sentences, based on the testimony of Suppa and other witnesses. References Bibliography Abrams, Floyd. Speaking Freely. Trials of the First Amendment. Penguin, 2006. ISBN 9780143036753 Capisi, Jerry. The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Mafia. Penguin, 2005. ISBN 1592573053 Capisi, Jerry. Jerry Capisi's Gangland. Penguin, 2003. ISBN 9781592571338 Capisi, Jerry and Robbins, Tom. Mob Boss. The Life of Little Al Diarco, The Man Who Brought Down the Mafia. Macmillan, 2013. ISBN 1250006864. Carlo, Philip. Gas Pipe. Confessions of a Mafia BS. William Morrow, 2008. ISBN 9780061429842 Critchley, David. The Origin of Organized Crime in America, The New York City Mafia, 1891-1931. Routledge Publishing, 2009. ISBN 0415990300. DeStefano, Anthony. King of the Godfathers. Big Joey Massino and the Fall of the Bonanno Crime Family. Pinnacle Books, 2007. ISBN 9780786018932 to Tavico, Peter J. The Mafia Made Easy, The Anatomy and Culture of La Cosa Nostra. Tate Publishing, 2007. ISBN 1602472548. Fitch, Robert. Solidarity for Sale. How Corruption Destroyed the Labor Movement and Undermined America's Promise. New York. Public Affairs, 2006. ISBN 1-891620-72-X. Gallo, Kenny and Randazzo, Matthew. Break Shot. A Life in the 21st Century American Mafia Simon & Schuster, 2009. ISBN 9781439195833 Garcia, Joaquin and Michael Levin. Making Jack Falcone. An undercover FBI agent takes down a mafia family. New York. Simon & Schuster, 2009. ISBN 1439149917. Goldstock, Ronald. New York State. Organized Crime Task Force. New York State Organized Crime Task Force. Corruption and Racketeering in the New York City Construction Industry. Final Report to Governor Mario M. Cuomo. NYU Press. 1991. ISBN 0814730345 Hogan, David M. Is the Mafia Still a Force in America? Greenhaven Press, March 10, 2006. Juvenile Nonfiction. ISBN 0737724021 Hoffman, William and Hedley, Lake. Contract Killer. The Explosive Story of the Mafia's Most Notorious Hitman Donald, Tony the Greek Francos. Pinnacle Books, 1994. ISBN 1558177884 Jacobs, James. Freel, Colleen and Raddick, Robert. Gotham Unbound. How New York City Was Liberated from the Grip of Organized Crime. NYU Press, 2001. ISBN 0814742475 Jenkins, John A. The Litigators, Inside the Powerful World of America's High Stakes Trial Lawyers Doubleday, 1989. ISBN 9780385244084 Justice, Commerce, The Judiciary, 
and related agencies appropriations United States Congress House Committee on Appropriations Subcommittee on Departments of State Departments of State Justice and Commerce the Judiciary and related agencies appropriations for fiscal year 1979 Kelly Robert J the upper world and the underworld case studies of racketeering in business Springer Science and Business Media December 6 2012 ISBN 1461548837 Carr Gordon and Welch, Claren Welch, Ian, Rats and Squealers, Dishing the Dirt to Save Their Skins, Ashet Group, 2008, ISBN 0708804942 Kroger, John, Convictions, A Prosecutor's Battles Against Mafia Killers, Drug Kingpins, and Enron Thieves, Macmillan, 2009, ISBN 0374531773 Lawson, Guy and Oldham, William. The Brotherhoods. The True Story of Two Cops Who Murdered for the Mafia. Simon & Schuster, 2006. ISBN 9780743289443 Lydic, Don. The Mob's Daily Number. Organized Crime and the Numbers Gambling Industry. Publisher University Press of America, 1999. ISBN 0761812660 Moss, Peter. The Valachi Papers. Harper Collins, 2003. ISBN 9780060507428 Milhorn, H. Thomas. Crime. Computer Viruses to Twin Towers. Boca Raton, Florida. Universal Publishers, 2005. ISBN 1-58112-489-9 Newton, Michael. The Mafia at Upolican, 1957. McFarland, 2012. ISBN 0786489863 Pileggi, Nicholas. Wise Guy. Life in a Mafia Family. Simon and Schuster, 1990. ISBN 0671723227 Rob Selwyn. Five Families. The Rise, Decline, and Resurgence of America's Most Powerful Mafia Empires. New York. St. Martin Press, 2005. ISBN 0-312-30094-8 Reville, Gill. Mafia Summit. J. Edgar Hoover, The Kennedy Brothers, and The Meeting That Unmasked the Mob. Macmillan, 2013. ISBN 1250021103 Report of the New York State Joint Legislative Committee on Crime, Its Causes, Control and Effect on Society. Issue 26 of Legislative Document, State of New York Legislative Document. The Committee, 1971. 1 Rudolph, Robert C. The Boys from New Jersey, How the Mob Beat the Feds. New York. William Morrow and Company Incorporated, 1992, ISBN 0-8135-2154-8, Sy Carl. The Mafia Encyclopedia. Infobase Publishing, 2005, ISBN 0816069891, United States Senate, 100th Congress. Organized Crime. 25 years after Valachi, hearings before the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the Committee on Governmental Affairs, United States Senate, 100th Congress, Second Session, April 11, 15, 21, 22, 29, 1988 U.S. GPO, 1988, United States Treasury Department, Bureau of Narcotics, forward by Sam Ginkana, Mafia, the Government's Secret File on Organized Crime. Harper Collins, 2009. ISBN 0061363855. Volkman, Ernest. Gangbusters. The Destruction of America's Last Mafia Dynasty. Faber and Faber, 1998. ISBN 0380732351. Newspaper Articles New York Times. Ex-crime boss testifies in Gotti trial by William Glover's in New York Times. Former crime boss testifies by Benjamin Weiser, New York Times. 
guilty plea in mafia case by Benjamin Weiser New York Times. Reputed crime boss enters a guilty plea New York Times. After mob, Joe Tafid, ex-crime boss, is scraping by New York Daily News. Little Joe sings about shakedowns by Robert Geardy, October 30th, 2002. Mob informants, Peter Fat Pete Chiodo, New York Daily News Associated Press sketches of nine arrested, an Associated Press article Magnuson, Ed. Magnuson, Ed. June 24th, 2001. Hitting the Mafia. Time. Retrieved November 15th, 2006. Time.com January 24th, 2001. External links Federal Bureau of Prisons Inmate Locator Website.